So, um, digital health is a very expansive uh, term. It includes uh, health IT that I'm sure you've had discussions of earlier in the day, uh, infrastructures, and of course, user devices and interfaces. I'm going to focus on anything related to um, user devices and interfaces, also known as uh, mobile health um, in other circles. I'm also going to touch on the state of regulatory and digital health, uh, or mobile health, and uh, if there's time, uh, go over some regulatory questions for the innovators in the digital health uh, arena, and again, if there's time, I had some questions. You've probably seen uh, this marvelous uh, picture here. Um, I just discovered it a few uh, days ago. Um, some of the num numbers are mind-boggling. Um, some of the numbers I don't even understand the size of it, exabytes and petabytes and uh, information like that. But um, 700 billion minutes a month is spent on Facebook. That's a lot of data. That's more than um, any single project uh, spent uh, in human history. Uh, for sure, uh, the Golden Gate is a fraction of that. I don't know about the, uh, the pyramids. Uh, that's probably why the Egyptian guy is looking at the numbers. Uh, but that's just a huge number. When we have these numbers, undoubtedly they're going to impact our lives and our um, medical um, equipments and um, health uh, systems. So uh, let me define what I mean by um, digital health here, acquiring and delivering health data, and the emphasis on data, outside of clinical facilities. Um, everything else is traditional. Uh, throwing a few numbers here, I uh, checked a few, uh, yesterday, a few days ago, uh, we have about 28,000 apps on the uh, Apple Store, about the same number in the Android Store, and a few thousands on the um, Windows uh, domain, uh, just a tremendous number of um, applications, um, more than 500% um, growth since um, 2009, and just since last year alone, more than almost doubled the numbers. But data are not new. We've seen numbers before, we've known people who've um, been in love with numbers. Benjamin Franklin used to collect numbers and see how he, he was doing. This is the, um, his temperance chart. Uh, he, had, um, vir he would collect um, his virtues, follow his virtues to make sure um, he reaches um, moral perfection. But that's a very rare individual. Now we have access to a lot of data, not just what we think we are, but we, what we, um, we can really measure, we can quantify. I'm going to borrow from the words of uh, Sinan Aral, where he said, revolutions in science have often been preceded by revolutions in measurements. Let's tweak this statement and say, revolution in healthcare will be preceded by revolution in measurement, accessibility, and big data. It's really the accessibility that's making a huge difference. And of course, the big data, those of you involved with algorithm and processing, that's where the big data is. And this revolution has reached the government. Uh, in words of uh, Jeffrey Shuren, director of Center for Devices and Radiological Health, uh, the use of mobile medical apps on smartphones and tablets is revolutionizing healthcare delivery. That's just last year. And here is revolution in making some of the uh, recent products uh, that have come to the market are coming to the market. I'm from Proteus Biomedical. We've squeezed our product there. We'll be uh, part of our product is in the market. The other parts uh, hopefully will be in the market coming soon. So, um, mentioned from Proteus Medical, this is an example uh, of um, a digital health product. Um, a lot of other products can behave similarly. Uh, our product, uh, we have an ingestible um, sensor. It's a grain of sand size uh, uh, micro sensor. It's an integrated uh, circuit, one millimeter, millimeter by one millimeter size. That the, uh, it's put on a tablet. 
the user takes it. Once it's wet inside the, the body, um, it, it gets activated and it yells, you know, I'm here, I'm here, somebody uh, notice I'm here. And the patch on the body notices that, takes the message that, uh, that, uh, that medicine, if it's with a medicine, or if it's not with a medicine, uh, just an event, is registered. And that is communicated through the mobile phone, goes to the clouds, very complicated analytics. The user can see what's happening to them. And the clinician uh, and payers can take a look. Um, the social networking on the top right is part of this. Uh, your social network, your support system. They know, they can know what you're taking, what you're doing, how your heart is doing, how, fa how, how your sleep is. So this is what I call a digital health system. It can have many benefits, and that's why we are in this business as well. Um, it can enable the consumers and patients to engage in their own health management. Know how much they slept, what medicine they took, did they take it? Are they following their prescription? How do they feel today? They feel sad today? They feel happy today? Um, so all bits of information and data can be helpful if it's uh, analyzed uh, properly. It can also help the physician to uh, make sure that the patients who need more help in terms of um, their health requirements, they're given more attention to. Because there's so much information, you can prioritize them, set up alarms, this patient didn't sleep enough, that patient didn't forgot their medication, maybe you should give them a call, see how they're doing. And some other patients are doing fine, so you don't have to call them. It also benefits um, the whole system in terms of um, reducing the healthcare cost. As you increase your adherence, um, there's a very good chance the, the cost, cost of the healthcare and rehospitalization is reduced. It's about um, 300 billion dollar a year cost of rehospitalization as a result of not following the prescription. On top of that, of course, is the heart failure and pneumonia and other diseases. So that's a brief introduction. Let me go uh, what the regulations and regulators um, are talking about. Oops, <laughs> vitamin E is not a app. Um, you, can, you can tell I did this in a hurry. Um, but I'll tell you why I put a vitamin E there. Um, we are at a very early stage of uh, digital health regulation and revolution. Uh, this is the same stage that the, uh, the vitamins and supplements were in the early 90s. If you wanted to make health claims, for vitamins, the FDA would treat it as a drug. You had to go through the burden of proof of bringing a drug to the market if you wanted to put um, this and that health claim on vitamin C or vitamin E. That's really burdensome, and that was really difficult. Um, that's where we are now. That's uh, where we were last year, especially uh, before um, new regulations um, on MDDDS and mobile apps uh, um, were shared with us by the FDA. So um, there are a lot of opportunities, there are a lot of unknowns, and I think it's a perfect time that the industry and the FDA, the regulators can collaborate and come up with innovations that ensure safety, clarity, and predictability. So uh, the digital health is, the mobile health is more than just an app on your phone. Um, it's not a game. It can be a game, but it's not a game only. It, they can aggregate information, and they can drive simple behavioral changes, can deliver the information to your healthcare providers, and of course they can help you make um, therapeutic or uh, diagnostic decisions. And the regulatory burden increases as the risk increases. If you make recommendation to do a procedure, if you identify a tumor, that's a very high risk diagnosis. So the re regulation is uh, more demanding for that. When 
and where a digital health product is a medical device and is regulated by the FDA. It's regulated by the FDA when it's a device. As you know, FDA regulates food, drugs, um, devices, cosmetics, um, since 2009, tobacco. And um, it doesn't regulate um, meat and poultry, by the way, but it regulates all the other foods. But as far as devices and digital health, it really falls within the device um, uh, quarter of the, the FDA. So what does that mean? What is a medical device? Let's talk about what FDA thinks a medical device. A device, a medical device is one that diagnoses, cures, improves, or treats, or prevents disease, or it affects the function or structure of the uh, body functions, body. But it doesn't do this through chemical reactions. That would be a drug. Anything else is a device. And there are three classes of medical devices. There are about 17,000 different categories or groups of devices uh, that we have product codes for at the FDA. And they're subgrouping three different categories. Of course, there are products that are not regulated. They're just fitness monitors. It's very easy to go to the market, um, usually not very expensive, and no reimbursement, of course if you're in medical business. But the first class uh, is a low-risk product. Um, only general controls are applied. Uh, it is a medical device. That's why you can make a medical claim. And you do not require, you're not required to uh, get an authorization from the FDA to go to the market. You have to register your product, of course. And these products are usually inexpensive. They're not uh, reimbursed. Separately, they are in base as part, part of the, uh, the procedure. Some examples are band-aids, gloves, of course, and most of the hearing aids are class one products. The, the next class of products are what we call Me Too products, where there's a predicate, a product just like that in the market already. And they do require general controls in terms of labeling and uh, design control but they also require some special controls for the given product. Some examples are power wheelchairs, CT scanners, uh, glucometers, contact lens products. And these products are really more expensive than the class one products. And usually not, uh, uh, they're usually reimbursed. It makes sense for them to be reimbursed, otherwise it doesn't make sense to be in that business. Um, so there's significant costs associated with them. The next class is the highest risk um, class of products, uh, things like um, pacemakers, um, stents, and other products. Uh, they usually sustain or support life. They're usually implanted. Uh, they emit energy, like pacemakers. Um, they, put, they present potential unreasonable risk um, uh, of illness or injury if they fail. For these, uh, not only you need the general control, a special control, you also need to show that they're safe and effective. Uh, some examples are, again, like weight loss devices implant, when implanted, um, cochlear implants, and breast implants. As you know, there are tremendous costs um, to bringing these products to the market, to doing the development and proving that they're safe and effective and finding a market for them. So they must be reimbursed if they want to survive the, the market. Now, going more specifically to digital, digital health, uh, let's look at the anatomy of digital health in a very simple way. At the center, of course, um, is patient and the patient's data. All the devices are connected to the patients. And the information, the data goes to the clouds, goes to the internet. There are intermediaries, insurances, payers, um, uh, government, and of course the healthcare provider on the top right, the physicians and surgeons. But life is not always this simple. These are the, the big components. Life in reality is much more complicated. Um, and Think of a pacemaker, for example. If anything related to pacemaker has to be dealt like 
a class of a pacemaker, life becomes very difficult to bring um, pacemakers to the digital health um, era. Let me um, throw you some uh, regulatory jargons. Um, it may be helpful um, in, in how we decide about what products um, go through what kind of regulations. Components are parts of finished devices and the regulatory burden for the components is the same as the, the entire product. If you have a pacemaker and of course it has some um, other functions inside and some components, uh, the, the same regulatory burden is applied for that uh, component. The firmware that's um, in a pacemaker or another product goes through the same requirements. Um, if you have, and then you have accessories that are not necessarily manufactured but by the same manufacturer as, as the product. But they're compatible, they have to work together, they can be purchased separately. And um, the regulatory class usually follows the regulatory class of the, the main device, unless there's a specific uh, clause that this, comp uh, this accessory has a lower class. For example, um, a mobile app can be a, an accessory. Um, the infusion pump tubing, the tubing is an accessory to the infusion pump. Um, the mobile phone itself it can be an accessory or it can be a device itself. Now, let's look at the software in particular um, in the digital health arena. Number one, for something to be a medical device is really the, um, the, medical, the claim you make. If it has a medical intended use, it's a medical device. It's very simple. And as the risk to the patient and the users increases, the scrutiny goes higher. Now, the software can have very different functions. They can simply dis display and store the information. They can transmit the information or collect the information, or they can get more complicated. They can analyze and convert the data using algorithm and other tools um, to come up with a diagnosis or recommendation. And as you can see, the, the risk um, increases. Now, as I said, it's all about the intended use. Let's look at the case of a, a weight scale. On the very left, the one you find in Walgreens, it's not a medical device. You just Get it to, to monitor your own weight. You put it in your bathroom. You won't track your own weight. But the one in your doctor's office, that's a medical device. That's a class one medical device. That is just for collecting data and medical stats. Again, the burden is not very high. Take the same weight scale. And in the case of a bariatric surgery, where, where the weight has to be monitored and the success of the procedure depends on how the patient gains weight or uh, loses weight. Um, that's, that's a weight monitoring aid for long-term um, health care system, uh, health system. So you see again the FDA scrutiny goes higher if that uh, product is used um, for that purpose. And again, at uh, the highest level you have a very high sensitive um, procedure if somebody has a heart failure, the weight needs to be monitored very closely on a daily basis or uh, less than that. Um, physicians get updates regularly on how patients are doing. Again, um, the weight monitoring is very critical in detecting the heart failure. This is ju just telling you how the intended use changes the, uh, the scrutiny for a medical product. Now, as of last year, uh, April last year, FDA introduced um, medical device data systems as class one medical devices. Uh, these are off the shelf or custom made um, hardware or software that display, transfer, they do not alter the data, and um, they have a preset uh, specs, uh, basically a display function or storage function. 
These are now called medical device uh, data system. They are now class one, the lowest of the uh, medical device uh, classifications. And the, for example, if you, um, your thermometer or your blood glucose uh, simply, or blood pressure uh, simply collects the data for display later, that's, that's a class, that's an MDDS uh, product and it's a class one. It's important to know um, what options we have in developing um, uh, mobile apps and digital health products um, because we always have to consider how easy we can get to the market, how easy the reimbursement is and being a medical device um, data system makes it easier now uh, to get to the market and pass the, uh, the FDA's requirements. Now, we talked about the mobile apps as a part of the digital health. Are they regulated or not? As I said, they're regulated if they're a medical device. And they're, reg they're regulated if they have a medical intended use. How would you know? Well, of course, uh, FDA has its own definition of medical devices, as we went through. But if the product could present a risk to patient if the app doesn't work as intended, uh, FDA becomes very careful about it. Uh, they can be used as, as accessory to the device, or they can become a medical device itself. Imagine an EKG uh, uh, recorder that, that was released uh, cleared a few uh, weeks ago, I think, by the FDA. You just put your uh, fingers on the, um, on the um, iPhone and it gives you your heart tracings. That's a medical device by itself. So a mobile, app, mo mobile phone has been converted to a medical device. But they're not regulated if they only help the consumers manage their own health and wellness. Again, very important to know what claims you want to make. You need to adjust your claims um, so um, you align them um, so you, you know you're going to the FDA or not going to the FDA. You're getting a medical CE mark, you're just getting a regular CE mark. Uh, the same story is uh, true in the Europe as well. Um, if it's a medical purpose, it's a medical device. What about HIPAA? Um, HIPAA um, health information. What is the HIPAA for? Um, yeah, health insurance. Sorry, health makes good business sense uh, to be HIPAA compliant if your product is going to be used by providers and hospitals. All right, there. Um, let me just look at my time. There are a bunch of questions that we can discuss, so I can just review them uh, here. You know, when a product uh, is MDDS, is cell phone a device, is all case dependent. Uh, we can discuss them, or we, uh, I will leave these questions um, to you. Um, if there are questions, we can discuss them. But um, this is a, how does the human's role in your solution impact regulatory considerations? If you have a product that you want your patients or users use OTC or the counter, uh, the risk is higher for that product. Uh, if the product is prescription only, uh, that's a special control by the FDA's uh, perspective. So if you have a product, uh, it's not easy to get to the market, you add it's not for OTC purpose. If you have enough data to show even as OTC is safe, then you can make it OTC. Go to the FDA again, have a PID meeting, meet with them, provide enough data that even without um, a prescription, the product is safe. But sometimes to get to the market sooner, we need to make compromises. Um, sometimes we need to say, my product does this in conjunction with these other tests because the purpose is to get to the market and do further testing while we're in the market. Um, there are a few other questions here. I'm running out of time. Uh, we have about 15 minutes for questions and answers. Let me briefly review uh, what we discussed today. Um, for softwares and apps, if it's a medical device, we must follow the design control. It's the law. If it's not a medical device, if we don't have a medical device claim, medical claim, it's of course a good practice 
and so the manufacturer is responsible for uh, quality of the product. So the takeaway lessons, um, digital health um, has a very strong potential uh, for the public health. Um, it's an incredible time. Um, we are at the dawn of digital health and we hope we can work with the FDA and the regulators elsewhere to make sure we um, can benefit the patients uh, in a predictable and transparent way. We do not always and cannot always rely on existing medical devices. That's a challenge. Um, before the MDDS regulation came last year, anything associated with a class three medical device would be considered a class three medical device. A very um, high level of scrutiny and demand by the FDA. Even a simple um, database that does nothing except collecting the data. Uh, so we need to have new regulations that apply to our digital health uh, needs. Um, but again, it's very, very important that innovations cannot come at the expense of uh, safety. Oh, thank you very much. And if there are any questions, I'll be happy to discuss with you. questions actually. One, can you comment on labeling requirements when the uh, iPhone becomes a medical device? Uh, and does the medical device uh, or labeling uh, subject the mobile device to agency testing, such as the 601 family? Yeah, the FDA has um, clearly said they do not hold the manufacturers of the mobile devices responsible. Uh, for the safety of the product um, when it's a medical device. Uh, so they do whatever testing they have to do that the FCC requires them. Um, but it's this, the, the uh, people who make the apps or they make the, uh, the software and make the phone a device, that's on them to make sure the product is safe and for the use as a medical device. So they need to include in their own labels. Um, I think until last year, maybe even now, um, Apple used to uh, throw some medical applications in their demos. Uh, I think they've uh, modified that, they've reduced that, uh, primarily because they didn't want to be known as a medical uh, device uh, manufacturer. Did I answer your question? Great. Yes, sir. I have the microphone. So, <laughs> um, a different class of information databases is bioinformatics. You know, sometime soon, we'll all have our genomes in a database, and there'll be the drug result data relative to the effectiveness of drugs relative to other people's genomes. And doctors will come to depend on a database like that on making decisions on which drugs to try or not on a particular patient. Right. Is there any discussion about when that might become a medical device because it's affecting so they, they, data by itself becoming a medical device? Database itself. Right, database itself. Database can be a medical device if it's for a particular patient and you drive a therapeutic or diagnostic um, conclusion for that particular patient. But if it's otherwise more like a textbook, right? It's like um, uh, when, when one can nurse, you know, the, the mom can nurse uh, their baby uh, or lactation uh, uh, calendars. Uh, if it's particular for a patient and a user, uh, that's a medical device. Yes, sir. We heard from two speakers this morning, one from HHS and one from CMS, about how the government is really trying to, um, you know, help foster innovation in order to uh, improve health care. I was wondering if the FDA is you know, doing anything to uh, streamline the process, advise innovative medical device companies so that that doesn't become a barrier to I, I believe so. FDA also has an innovation task force, which is uh, work, uh, which is at work, and um, 
we've met them before and other um, sponsors and manufacturers have met them. FDA is introducing new regulations and new guidances for uh, mobile apps. Um, they just downgraded uh, medical device data systems as, as a class one uh, medical product. So they are doing their part, but like everything else, it gets a little slow at, at the government level. So we need to be patient and encourage them to hurry up. Digital health procedures will allow us to identify when you take a pill, vitamin E, something that you can call a foreign body. Could you envision that it be used to track alcohol intake and give a report to the person who's drinking on their phone when their alcohol level is going up? Help your police to destroy the breathalyzer test and actually use it to improve health behaviors? It, it's very Star Trek-y, but it, it's quite possible. Um, I think we are, we are getting there. Um, if, um, if you have an event marker that goes on your medicine, uh, you can imagine the same thing going on, on your water bottle. It measures your hydration level, right? So you can measure your alcohol level at some point as well, yeah. Uh, we question that because uh, the inheritance rule that FDA has, uh, you know, you inherit the classification and the connecting. Now, there was a lot of uh, discussions uh, at least a year ago about uh, controlling the electronic medical records because, the, you know, the errors uh, that are found uh, contributed to some uh, patient safety issues, apparently. Now, uh, as also we are seeing that more and more medical devices are actually sending data directly to the electronic medical records, glucometers, and, and even a lot of telehealth systems these days. So the question is that, do you foresee that FDA is going to come and say, electronic medical record vendors, by the way, you are MDPS, or maybe a class two at some point? I don't think so. I think that they've specifically stayed out of the electronic health records. Um, I think that's probably more the CMS area where they're more involved. Um, I think FDA has enough in their plate um, to take care of uh, before they, they take care of the electronic health records. The MDDS classification doesn't include um, cases where you have to make immediate medical decisions. Um, so MDDS is more like for storing, displaying what's already displayed in other media. Um, those may be uh, dealt differently. You're right. If it has a higher risk and impact, it may uh, be considered as an accessory to uh, the higher class product. Um, in case of uh, uh, pacemakers and alarms, I think uh, the MDDS rule doesn't apply as much as it does in other cases. That's part of it. You're talking about from the FDA uh -huh. side? Yes. Um, no, no, we're not treated differently, any differently than other products. There are, um, there are a lot of other innovators that they have very good ideas and they're coming to the FDA. Um, there's always a little bit of caution when there's a new technology. Just, you know, the thought of having a microchip in just that uh, is it's a little... Uh, uh, for some people, troublesome. But if you think of it as a really grain of sand, it's silicon, right? Silicon is, is sand, uh, except it's synthetic silicon, and it carries information, has a little bit of minerals in it, so when it goes in your body, it gets activated and sends a signal, I'm here. Uh, so uh, I'm, we're not getting anything extra special from the FDA. We've, we've been very patient working with the FDA, and 
we'll see what happens. We'll, we're excited um, when something good happens. So, one last question. Uh, Zafar, thank you so much for the next presentation. I have thank you, Martin. the honor of the last question. And I am curious to talk about clouds. Um, software and analytics were originally in medical devices within the hospital organization, maybe living on cloud systems that were intensely regulated. But then, in the past few years, we have seen that moving to our iPhones and iPads and so forth, uh, devices that anywhere were contained and had a, physic, uh, a physical presence. And now the latest trend is for these same software and analytics moved entirely to the cloud. So the physical interface is very loose. And I was wondering what do you think is the perception of risk uh, by the FDA when looking and reviewing a device that <coughs> leave entirely in the cloud and if that may have an impact on the classification and That's a great question. Thank you, Marta. I think really it's a matter of um, education. Um, I think if the financial industry has managed to deal with the clouds and have very secure transactions, I think the medical industry can also do the same, make sure the um, transactions, the data inf information are secure. There's always a chance, even if it's on a piece of paper, there's always a, uh, the risk um, for the information to be um, modified or uh, manipulated. But, you know, we're at the cusp of this uh, digital health revolution. It takes a while for the FDA to grasp it, and I think they are grasping it. Uh, they are opening their arms to, to embrace the digital health. Uh, they see how cost-saving uh, for the government it can be, uh, just the the adherence number alone, $300 billion a year, it's not a small um, uh, pocket change uh, for anybody that I know. So I, I think they will come to that. It's just a matter of time and for everybody's um, benefit, I hope, especially the patients and the healthcare system. I hope it's sooner than, than later, as long as it's safe, again, for the, for the users. So um, I think they, they may be concerned, yeah. They, um, we have the, the, the ingestible event recorder, right? Um, we've heard, they say, you know, why do you need, you need it to be ingestible? You can just push a button. Because it's so new to them. But eventually they'll, they'll get used to it. That is the patient choice to choose what kind of, um, how they um, mark their, their events. Is it wirelessly or is it pushing a button or how? So I'm, I'm optimistic. Uh, Thank you. Thank you very much, organizers, and for you. For your